Today I want to talk about abortion. I got into a bit of a tiff earlier today on Twitter about this topic, uh, I think initiated by a comment made by some legislators in Virginia, uh, Democrats, about who should decide when a fetus is born in a severely deformed state, maybe borderline unviable, um, whether the state should be um, in charge of protecting the rights of that individual, regardless of what the doctor thinks, regardless of what the parents think about whether more harm or pain would in fact come to that child as a result of being um, artificially kept alive, rather than um, letting the infant, um, the just born infant, um, pass away um, naturally. And this comment was taken by some as, quote, a progressive fundamentalism, an expression of um, where progress progressivism supposedly leads when brought to an extreme on, on this issue of abortion, um, the murder of babies. And I want to try to talk about the possibility of um, a third way here where one can be both pro-life and pro-choice. I consider myself both pro-life and pro-choice. And how is that possible? Well, simple. Uh, personally, I am very much um, pro-life. I believe that responsible adults should um, be aware of the fact that when they have sex, it is possible that a child will be conceived and they should take responsibility uh, for that really miraculous uh, capacity that human beings have to create new life. Uh, it is a godlike power, and we shouldn't just fuck around with it um, because we can just get an abortion later. Um, on the other hand, this is a very personal opinion of my own, and I have to acknowledge um, the ambiguity and the difficulty of the moral, philosophical, religious, spiritual questions that are brought up all of the, um, you know, exceptional cases that could be articulated. And so as a result, even though personally I am pro-life, legislatively, I do not believe that the state should be telling women or parents or doctors um, what to do. I do think we need some reasonable limits on when abortions can be performed, but in certain limit cases, in certain ambiguous situations, I default towards letting the mother, the parents, the doctors who are there in the hospital room um, when, the, when the child is born, who have to make that difficult decision. I want them to be those who are, you know, they've got skin in the game. Parents don't want to kill their babies, right? I think there's a stereotype of um, this sort of careless um, woman or couple that just aborts um, fetuses uh, randomly without care. Um, you know, maybe there are a handful of people that are like that, but the vast majority of, of, of parents, of mothers, don't want to have an abortion, especially not in the third trimester or um, especially not when they're having to... They, you know, no one wants to have to make the decision about whether or not more harm or pain will come to a child if they are allowed to develop beyond that infant stage of just having emerged from the womb as a result of some severe deformity or what have you. No one wants to have to make that decision, but someone's got to make it. And I don't want the state making it with some abstract law handed down from on high. I want the people in the hospital room to make it. I want the, the mother who... Uh, donated her body for this child to be gestated to be the one making that decision, right? In consultation with uh, the father and the medical professionals who are taking care of her in that very moment. A lot of this comes down to the um, political ontology that we hold to. Um, and, you know, this is metaphysics, right? And it takes a lot of thought and study and reflection and consideration to unpack what is 
what the metaphysical implications are and, and presuppositions are for something like um, the rights of individuals. When does a fetus become an individual? You know, it's a gray area. Um, some people would say when it exits the womb, some people would say after the first trimester, some people would say at conception. You know, if we hold to a more traditional Christian view of the nature of the human soul, uh, I think the idea is that the soul is created at birth, at, at conception, uh, right? Um, if we hold to a more kind of biological view, it's like, well, if we're like a materialist, then there is no soul, and it's a matter of degree when society accepts uh, a human organism into the social domain, the legal domain, and says you have rights as an individual. Um, that depends on a cultural agreement, and it's a social construct ultimately. Now, my position is neither of these these extremes, right? I don't believe in an immortal soul, uh, an individual, personal, immortal soul. Nor do I believe that what we call the soul is just a social construct in the sense that it's not real and what's really real are, you know, neural, uh, you know, the excitation of, of, of neurons and the exchange of uh, molecules uh, within the skull. Um, you know, there are different ontologies that we can consider to help us sort out and make sense of, again, a difficult, ambiguous issue. Um, I've said in the past many times that individuality, as we understand it in the contemporary um, European and American context, is, I think, uh, a cultural phenomenon. It can't be separated from the unique history of the peoples that have um, brought forth what we call usually the Western um, mindset. Individuality is unique to that cultural and historical matrix. Uh, I value it highly as, as even though it is in some sense a construct. It, and and in, in my ontology, being a construct doesn't mean it isn't real. Because ultimately, atoms <laughs> are constructs, not social constructs made up in the minds of, of humans, uh, but cosmic constructs. This is a creative process and, you know, atoms were emergent uh, forms of complexity at one point, the most complex forms in the universe. And then they continued to evolve and emerged into more complex forms like stars and galaxies and planets and then cells emerged, right? These are all um, constructions. There's nothing necessary uh, about the fact that atoms exist, or that stars exist, or that cellular life exists, right? These are creative achievements. Um, similarly, the individual is something we become. It's a creative achievement, and it's not the creative achievement of just an organism, just a body. It's the creative achievement of a, of a society and a community. Um, in the same way that atoms are, you know, you don't get one atom in the universe. They're, they're a community, a society of atoms, and each atom depends on its relationship to other atoms in order to be what it is. Its essence is relational. So the essence, and this is my political, political ontology, and I'd love to have a good faith conversation with people about how they, how they articulate themselves at this ontological level when asked to define what an individual is and where it comes from. But in, in, in my ontology, yeah, we become individuals. It's an achievement. And it's a social as much as it is uh, an organic achievement. Uh, and, you know, we've got to do this together. And, you know, if I need to um, be more diplomatic in my interactions with folks who disagree with what they think I'm saying you know, I'll own up to that and try to do my best moving forward. But I think it's far more helpful for us if we can avoid shouting political slogans at one another and instead uh, engage in a good faith discussion where we can learn from each other about things we haven't considered, about an issue that we have to all admit is morally fraught and ambiguous and that raises all sorts of deep religious and philosophical questions. And then if we just, you know, march into these debates about abortion, 
uh, with some kind of um, certainty and fundamentalist uh, urgency, then we're going to be blind to all the things that we haven't considered in our perhaps, um, you know, self-satisfying uh, positions. So, yeah, abortion. When you think about it. <laughs>